there is an instrument called a polarimeter, and this thing has been around since the 1800s. There is an eyepiece that you can look through. This right here is my eyeball. That's an eyeball. I'm looking through the polarimeter, right, just so you're not confused. If you're not looking up at the board, you will think, what is that crazy symbol? That's an eye looking that way. And in here is polarized, polarized filters that can let through light. And on the other side, I mean, in the instrument or maybe in some sort of a box, there is a light bulb. Now, the light bulb absolutely must be monochromatic light. So like one wavelength, yellow, red, whatever that wave, usually it's like a sodium vapor lamp, so like a yellow wavelength or something like that. And the most peculiar thing happens when you put a cuvette in the middle here with a chiral substance. It's really bizarre, but it's what the optical rotation is all about. So first we need to figure out what these polarizing filters do. Now, what I'm trying to discuss is the difference between things like an antiomers and diastereomers. So, in antiomers, I've already kind of talked about this when I just started the entire chapter, and I said, my hands are basically an antiomers. Now, I know most of my life I've used my right hand, so I'm not really good at writing with my left hand. But my right hand could grip a pen the way my left hand could grip a pen. My right hand could open and make a fist the same way. It could point the exact same way. Yeah, one is more strong, but that's only because of how I used it throughout my life. So these two things are actually equal in every respect, just like enantiomer molecules are equal in every single respect. There's only two things that make them different. Enantiomers are different. Actually, I should say they have exactly the same chemical and physical properties except two things. And it turns out those two things are one of each. One of them is a chemical property and the other one is a physical property. The chemical property is how the enantiomer would behave, how it behaves. And when I say behave, I don't mean like, you know, you're a good person, bad person. Behave means how it reacts, how it interacts, how it bonds, how it behaves in a chiral, in a chiral environment or how it reacts, reacts with chiral substances. Isn't this what we talked about? Like, didn't I say, look, my right hand is the same as my left hand. I could hammer a nail, hammer a nail. But when it comes to screwing in a screw, the right hand and the left hand is different because the screw is chiral and my hands are chiral. So my right hand fits into a right-handed glove my left hand won't fit into the right-handed glove, right? It's, wh it's when they're interacting with chiral things, they're different. Limonene is going to be different when it interacts with one of my receptors versus the other one when it's R-limonene versus S-limonene. Do you remember the limonene example? I really like the limonene example, by the way. Did you catch on that R-limonene is the molecule that makes oranges smell like orange? And S, remember S means the left, lemons. Right? R for R, L for L. Right? Hopefully you remember that example forever. So that's one way enantiomers are different. And, the, and that, by the way, is a chemical property because that's how it bonds and reacts. Right? And the other way that they're different is a physical property. The direction of rotation, and in parentheses I have to write, but not the angle, 
of rotation. So forget the parentheses for just a second. Enantiomers are different when it comes to the direction of rotation of plain polarized light. Plain polarized light. And they're different by direction but not angle. Meaning, if I know one enantiomer rotates light 17 degrees to the right, then the other enantiomer rotates light the same angle, 17 degrees, but the other direction to the left. Right? It is the direction, not angle. And what the hell is plain polarized light? It's not plain meaning ordinary, like I'll have a plain bagel. Not a plain bagel. More like the vertical plane, the horizontal plane, that kind of a plane, right? Planar. So, if you take a light bulb, monochromatic light bulb, I think everybody knows that light goes in all directions, right? So this light bulb is going to scatter light in every single direction. But over here is a tunnel. It's a cylinder called a polarimeter. And light is going into this tunnel. Beams of light are going into this tunnel. What is interesting is, if this light bulb is shining light, it's shining light in every direction, but what about the direction that's coming at you? It's a wave. So the wave that's coming at you, coming off of the light bulb, is propagating like a wave and it's coming at you. The thing is, not every wave is propagating the same way. So imagine that in the vertical we say this is a zero degree angle. Let's just start from up and down being a zero degree. Some of the waves are going at you zero degrees, and they're just moving up and down. Some of the waves are coming at you at one degree. They're moving like this. Some of the waves are two degrees. Some of the waves are 90 degrees. Can you imagine every kind of wave? It's not spinning. It's just when the light bulb lets out a, a beam of light, some of the photons are moving in a wave up and down. Some of them are moving like this. How do I depict that? Before it hits this polarizing filter, the light, this is how we do it in physics, and when you take physics two, you will see this, that the light that's going this way, if it was coming at you, like you're seeing it, some of the waves are moving up and down, some of the waves are like actually 90 degrees with respect to that, moving left and right, some of the waves have this angle, some of the waves have this angle. Is it possible for us to understand that, I'll just show you two of the waves, one of the waves can be moving side to side while this wave is moving up and down. So they're like propagating in just different angles with respect to the vertical, right? And there's all 360 degree angles. So this is, I can't depict every single angle, but I'll pick, I'll pick this angle, the wave is going like this at you, this the wave is going like that at you, a different wave is going like that at you. It hits a polarized filter. This is made up of certain molecules that block certain beams of light. The way that we show this in uh, textbooks in this like cartoon kind of a way is imagine there was very thin slits, very narrow slits that are in the vertical direction. So imagine I have this wood block that has very thin vertical slits. And if you're a wave of light moving up and down, you'll slide right through that vertical slit. And if you have any other angle of propagation, like let's say you're moving this way, the slit is not horizontal, so you crash right into the disk. So after this disk, the only waves that made it through are the waves that are moving only up and down. And now, this is unpolarized light. But this light is polarized. Pole, polar. Polar, not like positive and negative, polar like North Pole, South Pole. This is polarized up and down in the vertical plane. Do you see everything is yeah. in one plane? So this is vertically polarized light. Anybody have polarized sunglasses? Try this on the beach on a sunny day. You're sitting and you're staring at the ocean. You got your sunglasses. The sun is beaming on the ocean, but you're okay. And then just lay down. You suddenly half blind yourself. So sunglasses, 
that are polarized are disks that are sort of like that, that have vertical polarization. Because it turns out that surfaces are horizontal with respect to where our eyes are. So when you have light, like the sun, hitting surfaces, it reflects it in a horizontal way. So imagine all reflected light comes at you and it's like side to side reflected, right? What would happen if light is coming at you in a side to side way, but you're wearing glasses that have vertical openings? All of those side to side stop and you get no reflected light into your eyes. What happens if you lay down? All of that reflected light goes right into your eyes. You start blinding yourself, right? If you had two pairs of polarized sunglasses, test this out, see if I'm wrong. If you have two pairs of polarized sunglasses, if I put a light bulb behind here, obviously it's going to be darker than looking at the light bulb directly. Just like this is obviously going to be darker than this because half of the waves got canceled out by the disk. There's only approximately half of the waves left, so it's darker. If I put another pair of polarized sunglasses overlapping, it's going to be darker. So it's going to be especially dark in this region, right? But you're still going to be able to see some light going through that region. If you took two pairs of sunglasses that are polarized and made them go overlap like this, there would be no chance that you see anything over here. Why? Because these are polarized in this way these are polarized in this way. Could you tell there's no way that light can make it through both? See, like, imagine over here, take away this cuvette. Imagine over here I have vertical polarization. Any light that made it through here will slide right through here, and you will end up with light. You'll end up seeing light. Your brain can't tell the difference between polarized and unpol sorry, unpolarized and polarized light. You can't. If I showed you a regular light bulb versus polarized light, uh, assuming it's the same brightness, this is not the same brightness, but imagine I showed you uh, one light bulb of unpolarized light, or I put two light bulbs here and you look at, the, look at it through the polarized filter, because since the polarizing filter cancels out half the waves, two light bulbs over here will be just as bright as one light bulb directly, and your brain would not be able to say, oh, these waves are, you can't tell how, which way, look at light, you can't tell the wave, the waves are moving, they're just coming at you. But the point is that over here you would see brightness, right? Now imagine I took this back filter, which you've done in Gen Chem, and rotate it. Remember that plastic tube in Chem tube? If I rotate this back plate until it's horizontal like this, do you realize I would see no light over here? Because anything that made it through the first filter would definitely not make it through the second filter since all the light is moving up and down and it just crashes. So here is the most bizarre, crazy thing. If I took a cuvette of water and put water in there, you turn on the light bulb, you look over here, and you see light coming at you. Why? Because water's clear. You wouldn't be able to tell that, right? Next to this water, imagine I had a cuvette or a test tube or whatever filled with this substance. What is that substance? That substance is R2-butanol. If I had both of these test tubes in front of you, one with water, one with R2-butanol, you wouldn't be able to tell me which one is which. If you smelled it fine, you'd say alcohol, right? But if far away, you would be like, they're both water, I don't know, they're both clear, they don't look like anything, this should freak you out if you would do this experiment. You have no cuvette over here, no cuvette. You turn on the light bulb, this disc is fixed, but you could move this bag disc, keep it vertical, look through and see light. Take water, put it in the path, still see the same amount of light. And you'd be like, obviously, water's completely clear. Take butanol, put it here, and you see darkness. Wouldn't that be weird? Like, imagine you pick up a bottle of Poland Spring, and you look through it at the light, and you'd be like, yeah, I could see light, it's clear. And you pick up a bottle of the butanol, and you look at it at the light, and it's pitch black. You'd be like, but it's clear. Why is it pitch black? Well, what the hell is going on? Because R2-butanol is a chiral substance, 
and chiral substances are optically active. And optical activity means it rotates plain polarized light. So I'm going to show you what it does. I'm not going to say how it does it because nobody knows how it does it. Well, when I say nobody knows, it's the same way that nobody knows that the reason that branched alkanes are more stable than unbranched alkanes is due to geminal interactions. Nobody knows that either because it hasn't been conclusively proven, but it seems to work and it seems to be the right reason. If you have a substance that's chiral, it's got a point in it that's not invertible or mirrored, right? No inversion center, no mirror plane. And that means that location has different areas of bonding regions. And if it has different areas of bonding regions, those bonds have different electron densities. And of course, light is called electromagnetic radiation. So if you have different densities of electron regions, you have different magnetism that emerges from that. And from different magnetism, it interferes with light differently if you're a right-handed way or a left-handed way. So we know sort of why it rotates light, but this is how it rotates light. This is such a crazy visual effect. If I put R2-butanol in here and I turn on that light bulb, light is going in every direction like this. So into this polarimeter, some waves are moving up and down, some waves are moving to the side. The ones that are moving to the side just crash into the disk and from this point on, only waves moving up and down are going. They're moving and if they hit R2-butanol, all of the waves tilt and from that moment on move in this direction. And R2-butanol rotates light negative 14 degrees. And I keep using R2-butanol to remind us that R does not mean to the right. R does not mean to the left. It's case by case specific. R could be left, R could be right. I know the con Engel prelog circle is clockwise with the lowest in the back. That has nothing to do with the polarimeter. Do you remember I said that? Nothing to do with the polarimeter. Now, if you have R2-butanol, and it rotates light negative 14 degrees. If instead I used S2-butanol, it would rotate light the other way because it's a mirror image of those magnetic moments. So it would be positive 14 degrees. And if I put equal amounts of R2-butanol and S2-butanol, if you're a light beam and you're flying through that cuvette, you are going to hit an R2-butanol and get tilted one way, but then you'll hit an S2-butanol and get tilted back, or you'll get hit an S2-butanol, then hit an R2-butanol, and eventually you'll just go right through without any optical rotation, as long as there's equal amounts of them. And this is where the math comes in. Do you guys have a sense of, like, the polarimeter? Because you've maybe done this experiment in chem, too, so you should kind of think back and be like, that kind of makes sense. Here's where the math comes in. If I have a mixture of R2-butanol and S2-butanol, I know, I'm kind of contradicting myself. I should call it S-butane-2-ol and R-butane-2-ol. But it's simple, so I could put the two in front and nobody's confused, right? If it was butene-ol, then I would have to say where and what. But if I had a mixture of them, the rotation is zero. Not really. Not really. It has to be perfectly racemic to be a zero rotation. This is a calculation called an average by abundance. It's the same kind of calculation that gives us the masses on the periodic table, the average by abundance. Think of it as a number line. With negative 14 being here, positive 14 being there, and zero being in the middle. If I had a 100% pure R2-butanol sample, then the rotation of that sample would be negative 14 degrees in the polarimeter. If I had a 100% pure S2-butanol sample, Put that 100% pure sample in a polarimeter, rotates light positive 14 degrees. And if I had a 50-50 mixture, it's going to rotate 0 degrees. Could I have a mixture that rotates 7 degrees? Could I have a mixture that rotates negative 3 degrees? Could I have a mixture that rotates 49 degrees? 
So you can't go more than 100%, but you could have every kind of percent in between. And it's relatively simple calculations that will determine. And we need to be able to do these calculations because in Orgo 2, in Chapter 25, when you're going to be hella stressed, like super stressed, there's this one little paragraph that's like, oh, yeah, we know how to calculate all this stuff. So now's the time to know how to calculate all this stuff. Trust me, you're not going to be less stressed then. Actually, you are. You're going to listen to me, and you're going to have no stress at all. You're going to love Orgo. You're going to become a chem major. A lot of people do. Just realize this is the first real thing you're learning. Like, I know in other classes you could talk about like history, politics, theology, whatever he said, they said. But you're learning about the material universe around you, what things are in you, and how they're actually operating. Like, this is like the reality of every physical object around you should be the most interesting. And we're about to, in a, in a chapter or two, learn Harry Potter spells. We're going to mix A with B and create potions, right? So if you look at it that way, it's kind of cool. Not, not like, what are we memorizing? Imagine you have, so first, I should define this. That's the Greek letter alpha, the first letter of the alphabet. What's the second, la second letter? Beta. Alpha, beta, alphabet. Ta. Anyway. Uh, alpha is the symbol that we use to describe specific rotation. Right? So I could say something like the alpha of R2 butanol is equal to negative 14 degrees, right? That's the symbol. For example, the symbol is N for number of moles. The symbol is T for time. I'm not talking about the units. The units is S for seconds. But the symbol for the term is T for time. For the degrees it rotates, specific rotation of a sample, the, it used the term alpha. All right? So here's a type of question that we could kind of get. Um, what? Are, or what is the composition, or what are the fractions? What is the fraction, or what are the fractions of R and S in a mixture of two butanol if? the specific rotation, I could just say this, if the alpha of the sample is 7 degrees. And then, of course, the problem will give you, like in parentheses, the alpha of the R is equal to negative 14 degrees. And that's enough information to figure out what the fractions of R and S are in, in the sample. And then you can realize that there is the term racemic, but there's also, a, it's a, so racemic can mean that there's equal amounts of R and S completely and the rotation is zero degrees. Or you could say a portion of the sample is racemic. For example, imagine I had a flask with these butanols, and I had one, two, three, four of them being R, and one, two, three of them being S. The rotation of an R and an S cancel each other. The rotation of an R and an S cancel each other. The rotation of an R and an S cancel each other. So do you see this section is racemic? Like there could be a percent racemic. Imagine I had 50 R's and 40 S's, right? Wouldn't that mean that 40 S cancels out with 40 of the R? So out of 90 things, 80 of them are racemic. 80 out of 90 are racemic, and 10, 10 out of 90 is pure, is the, is the leftover that's actually doing the rotation. And we're about to do this math. It's kind of, it's, it's high school level math. Here's how you set it up. It is an average by abundance. I don't think I talked about average by abundance calculations here. I don't remember. Did I talk about average by abundance? I didn't. So let me discuss average by abundance really quick and show you how this is basically that. 
If you took two exams and you got a, an 80 on one and a 100 on the other, what is your average? The answer most people would give you is a 90, but you should first inquire on whether they both count the same. For example, if that's your midterm and that's your final, usually finals are worth more than midterms, right? So your average is not necessarily in the middle, it's towards the side that counts more, right? When you take an average, what do you do? You add them and divide by two. That's the same as saying 80 over 2 plus 100 over 2. Everyone understand the math that I just did? Okay. That's the same as saying 1 half times 80 plus 1 half times 100. All I'm doing is just like expanding that, right? And this is a perfect average because you're saying half of the grade is the 80 and the other half of the grade is the 100. But you could find out your grade even if they're not worth the same. What if your professor said that this first exam is worth 40% and this exam is worth 60%? What you would end up writing is not half times 80 plus half times 100. It's not half and half. You have an 80 and you have 100. But what fraction of the total grade is the 80? It's 40%, so you would say that's 0.4 times the 80. And this one is 60%. It's 0 0.6 times the 100. Do you see how that works? And add that up. This is 60. What is this? 0.4 times 80. It's 32, right? So your grade is not 90, which is in the midpoint. It's skewed towards the side that's worth more, right? It's 92. You were supposed to know this from the periodic table. I'm going to talk about this right now because we're going to need this at the end of the semester for NMR anyway. There are two chlorines in the universe. There are two chlorines. There's chlorine 35 and there's chlorine 37. That's the kind of chlorines that are in the universe. And the, the number for mass on the periodic table is the average mass of these. It turns out that when you look at the chlorine on the periodic table, chlorine says 35.453. This periodic table is not good enough. It doesn't have that decimal. Uh, there is no chlorine atom that has this mass. For example, if you got an 80 and 100 and your average is a 92, you didn't get a 92 on any one exam. You got an 80 and 100. Your average was the 92. There's no chlorine with a mass of 35.45. This is supposed to be the number of protons plus neutrons. What's 0.45 of a neutron? Do you see what I mean? This is an average based on their abundance. If they had equal abundance, what number would that be? 36. It'd be right in the middle. But they don't have equal abundance, so how do you figure out their abundance? It's pretty easy, just pay attention. We can say that there's some amount of the 35. And we could also say that there's some other amount of the 37. And we could say that when we take that amount, like imagine that's, let's, let's say we're 50-50. It would be 0.5 times this plus 0.5 times that, and that would give me the answer of 36. I don't know how much of this there is and how much of this there is, but I do know the answer. It's 35.453. The problem is you can't solve this one equation because it has two unknowns, but there's always a second equation when you're talking about parts. The parts always add up to equal the whole. Remember, if this is like 50%, this is the other 50. If this is 40%, this is 60. If this is 10%, that's 90, right? So I could rewrite this in a slightly different way. I could say it's x times 35. This is a decimal, right? Like anything between 0 and 1, right? It's x times 35 plus, tell me this doesn't make sense or it does, all of it minus the x, so that means the rest of it. If x plus y is 1, then y is 1 minus x. The rest of it times 37, and that equals 35.453. Do you see that you could solve for x, and x is the amount of 35, and 100 minus that percent is the amount of 37? Can you solve this for homework? And prove to me that there is 75% of one of them in the universe, and 
25% of the other in the universe, meaning one of them is three times more abundant than the other one. 75 to 25 is three, three, divide, three to one. So the rotation of a sample works the exact same way. Look at the general formula. Now we get to solve this. Look at the general formula. The rotation of a sample is going to equal to the fraction. I'm going to write f for fraction. When I write f for fraction, I mean actually decimal, but because a fraction is a decimal, when you divide it. The fraction that is r multiplied by the rotation that the pure r does plus the fraction that is s multiplied by the rotation that the pure s does. Do you see that you could have parts? Can we prove racemic? Watch, let's prove racemic. Let's say we had equal amounts of R and S, right? Now, I'm not doing this question. I'm just saying equal amounts of R and S. The rotation of the R is negative 14. The rotation of the S is positive 14. And if we had equal amounts of them, wouldn't we have 0.5 of this one and 0.5 of this one? And what would be my rotation of the sample? Zero. And my sample's not optically active which means my sample is not chiral. Even though my sample has chiral parts, the whole sample is not rotating light, so it's not chiral as a whole. Ah, so you can have chiral parts, and the whole thing could not be chiral. That's the idea of meso. Take molecules, glue them together, they have chiral parts, and the whole thing's not chiral. That makes sense? Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to find a way to walk around not to be on camera. I'm not shutting this off and stitching it together. Walk behind everybody, squeeze to that side of the room as much as you can. So let's answer this question. I really hope you don't end up on camera right now. Just get close to that side. And you are totally off camera. Fantastic. Have a nice day. It's open. Just pull hard. There you go. Brief mishap. Okay, so to answer this, first of all, I don't need to give you the specific rotation of R and S because you know if you know R, you automatically know S. Right? How do we set this up? The sample, 7 degrees, is equal to the fraction that's R. I don't know what R is, right? I don't know that the question is how much R is there, right? The fraction that's R multiplied by the rotation of R, which is negative 14, plus the fraction that's S multiplied by positive 14, right? But do you see I don't have to write the fraction that's S? I could write something else. 1 minus the fraction that's R. And I'm going to multiply that by positive 14. I could very easily solve. This becomes such an easy... 7 is equal to negative 14 fractions of r plus 1 times 14 plus negative 14 fractions of r. Do you see that? Right? First, inner, outer, last. I heard they taught other kind of weird math, like PEMDAS and BOD was something. I didn't learn that when I was in, in, in grade school and junior high school. I just learned math. I didn't learn these like weird sentences. But if it works for you, it works for you. We could just solve this now. If I bring this 14 to this side, right? Minus 14, 7 minus 14 is negative 7 is equal to, and I just put those together, negative 14 fractions of R, negative 14 fractions of R gives you negative 28 fractions of R. Yeah, you're with that? 
and if you have negative 28 fractions of r is negative 7, just get rid of the negatives and you could say 7 is 28 fractions of r. So you divide by 28 on both sides and I just found out the fraction of r. 7 out of 28 things are r. Not that there's 28 in total, but for every 28 things, 7 of them are r. Do you see that? Which means I could immediately say what the fraction of s is. 21 out of 28 things are s. And then we could take it one step further and talk about what percent this is racemic and what percent of this is pure. Now let this, this is like something that students have trouble with because they're trying to make it mathematical rather than conceptual. Like when they get it conceptually, the math is easy. Imagine I drew 21 S's. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 21 S's. And then I drew 7 R's. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Do you see the, you take the lesser number, not the 21, but the lesser number, because these 7 will cancel out 7 of those. Right? You're looking at the smaller number. The smaller number will cancel out some of the bigger number. This portion of my sample is not rotating light because every R that it hits cancels one of the S's that it hits, right? It is this portion of my sample that is rotating light. This is the portion that is enantiomeric excess. This is the enantiomer that's extra compared to the racemic portion. This circled portion is my racemic portion. It's called racemic, not racemic, racemic, or any other kind of race word, racemic. So what is the fraction that's racemic? Do you see my fraction that's racemic is 14 out of 28? Watch. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 out of 28 in total. 14 out of 28 is racemic, right? which means my enantiomeric excess is 14 out of 28. There's a little check to see if we did this right. Tell me it doesn't make sense that if we get any rotation in the sample, it's not the racemic part that's rotating it, it's the extra enantiomer that's rotating it, right? Like the racemic's canceling itself out, so this portion is rotating, right? So another formula I could write is the specific rotation of my sample is equal to the rotation of the enantiomer in excess multiplied by the enantiomer in excess fraction. Right? Let's see if that's true. What is my alpha of my sample going to be if What's the specific rotation of the enantiomer in excess? Which of these is the enantiomer in excess? It's the S. And what is the rotation of the S? It was positive 14, right? So this is positive 14. And what is my fraction of the enantiomer in excess? It's 14 out of 28, or 1 half, right? Multiplied by 0.5. What's the answer come out to? Seven, like it originally was, right? Do you see that? So this, for years, was the, the, the lesson that I gave before I actually discussed meso. I would say, imagine you have a molecule that's R2-butanol that rotates light negative 14 degrees. And if you had a mirror, then in that mirror, you would have a molecule that is... S to butanol, and it would definitely rotate light positive 14 degrees, right? And if I had a flask that had both of these, both of these in the flask in same amounts, the flask would not rotate light. So what if I tied these on a string? Then the whole molecule would never rotate light because half of it is canceling out its other half in terms of light rotation. So one way you know something is meso is if it has the same groups and one of the groups is doing like an R rotation, 
giving you some degrees, and the other side is doing like an S rotation, giving you the opposite degrees. So as a molecule, it's like racemic mixture, but just always glued together. Do you see the concept? I hope you understand the concept. And that is what a meso molecule is, because look, if I have that connected in this molecule, do you see I have a mirror plane? Do you see the mirror plane? And if I take this molecule now, and I draw the mirror image of this molecule, it's absolutely superimposable on its own mirror image. You see these two are superimposable? Think about it. If I have a compound that has an inversion center, that means I've got maybe chiral centers that are like R or S, this chiral center right here might be making light want to rotate one way, but I've got an inverted center with the same groups. You see, I'm not talking about R rotates light one way and a completely different molecule's S rotates the opposite way. If you knew, let's say this, if you knew R2 butanol rotates light negative 14 degrees, would you know what S to fluoro or whatever, you have no, it didn't unrelated, not related. But if you know that R2 butanol rotates light in a certain degrees, then S2 butanol rotates the opposite way, right? If you know a carbon that has a fluorine with a next to it an oxygen, next to it a CH2, that rotates light one way, then the opposite direction carbon with a fluorine with next to it an oxygen next to it, that would rotate light equal opposite direction. So that inversion center means that if there's any rotation on one side, it's inverted with groups pointing the other way, it would rotate light the opposite way. And by definition, if this starts wanting to rotate anything, this will uh, cancel it. And if this wants to rotate anything, that will cancel it. Do you see, think about a meso substance. Think about the meso substance in general, CL, BR, I, I, BR, CL. This has chiral centers. If they were separated, that would rotate light one way, this would rotate light the opposite way. I could know it's meso if I knew, look, one, two, three, and the lowest is this way, this is S. If it's meso, this must be R. Because whatever groups it has, it should have the same groups. And if this is an S trying to rotate light one way, then the other side is canceling it, rotating light the other way. This is not meso. And if you work it out, this is not an S and an R, or an R and an S. It's an S and an S. They're like adding a rotation. That makes some kind of sense. There's going to be questions in the nucleophilic substitution, elimination, and so on that deal with stereochem. We're going to learn all these reactions, and the question on the exam will be like, yeah, yeah, you know the reaction. What's the stereochem? And people will be like, oh my god. Don't, don't, don't be that person. Thank you for your participation. Have a great day. Like and subscribe.